This is the second video on a series of web development talks. Um, in this one, I wanted to focus more on web design. And so I'm going to talk more about HTML and CSS specifically. For this talk, I was inspired by the TV show Cake Boss. In that show, you've got a bunch of contestants who are showing their mastery of creating works of art using cakes. And um, so let's go into like their general workflow. If you've ever watched any episode of Cake Boss, you'll see that first of all, each of the chefs in that show, or I should probably say baker, they start with building the structure for the cake that they are going to ultimately present. In building the structure, you want to have uh, solid pieces to get maybe the right height or width and just be able to support all the decorative items that come about later in the process. Um, so here we have a person layering on uh, multiple layers to build a cake just to get it high enough before they start working with the other uh, pieces to decorate it. Now, once you have that structure, um, and say for instance, you are building a online store, you would wanna have uh, little boxes on the page that allow for product details to be shared. But, you know, just showing the image, maybe it's not enough to make it a really nice website. Um, or if you're making an online newspaper, showing the content isn't enough. Like you wanna think about how to make it look nice. Um, so once you have the structure, which is allowing pieces to show up on the page, then the next thing you want to do is think about how it looks. So the second stage of the Cake Boss workflow is to style the structure. Once you've got layers of cake in place, you can round out the corners, shave it down to get the shape just right. You can also lay on icing to recolor and smooth out the structure. Um, so basically those two steps are very similar to web design workflow as well. You want to focus on the structure and that would be the content and then you want to focus on the styling and the presentation separately. It's not to say that you have to work on each of these separately and in that order of structure before style, but typically uh, be best practice will show that this will be more efficient um, for, for most people who do web design. If you were to be hired as a front-end uh, engineer, a web designer, um, you might consider having uh, a special attention devoted towards the structural elements and then special attention focused towards the styling element. So that's just generally good advice. So now that we have a framework for like the two general workflows, I want to go in to a more detailed uh, description of HTML and CSS. The ingredients for web design include HTML and CSS. You might have a few other things like JavaScript, but that's going to be for a different lecture. This one, we're just going to focus on HTML and CSS only. You might be wondering what do these acronyms mean and how do they fit together? HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It refers more to the structural components of a web page, whereas CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets and is more focused on the styling presentation of websites. HTML has two parts to it. It has the hypertext portion, which means each document can contain links to other websites. And that means if we think about data structures for a moment, it can be one link to the next page and that page links to another, like a link list. Or it could be more like a tree where you have a home page linked to a few different pages and then from there, subpages and so on. Or you could have a graph where 
uh, child nodes can link back and cycle back to the home page or to siblings, etc., and so on. So hyper, hypertext refers to the linking nature of different documents of a site. You can also have hypertext links where you have a very long page and the links jump to different sections on that page. The second part of HTML is the markup language component. When you create a web page, you have a way using just HTML without CSS, you have a way to format how text is going to appear on the page. You can have bolded text, you can have titles, you can have tables, images, and, and so on to show a different presentation of select words to help with readability of documents. So the markup language has special characters in that document that allow the viewing application, the user interface, to be able to render the text with the formatting. These two parts, hypertext and markup language, is what makes HTML. Now moving on to the second thing with web design, CSS, uh, we have a bunch of style rules that can be defined, and you can put them in files called style sheets. The cascading part of the title comes from the idea of inheritance. HTML tags are structured very much like a tree. And so a parent node with a certain style can have its style inherited by its children nodes, so it cascades down. And depending on how you specify the styles, it can either apply to the whole structure or select paths in a tree or select uh, subtrees within that tree. The other thing with cascading style sheets is that you can specify different looks for different format, or sorry, different presentation formats. You can allow a certain style for when you're printing the HTML page uh, separate from when it's viewed on a mobile device and separate also when it's viewed on a desktop computer screen. To sum this up, we've got two components. Um, these are both very meaty words uh, with a lot of information included into these acronyms, but at least now you know you've got the two acronyms and how they fit together. One is more on the style and one's more on the structure. We're gonna start first with HTML. Uh, we want to start with the structure first, so that's why we start with the HTML. We're going to start with the basic parts of it. It's not going to be a comprehensive or thorough introduction to HTML. Instead, it'll be more of just how to get started. I've included some helpful links in case you wanted to know a little bit more about the specifications, um, different techniques, validating uh, validator tools. Uh, or even online courses that go into more depth with how to use HTML. Um, so if you would like to explore more on your own, definitely feel free to check these links out. HTML came from a line of computer science research work on digital presentation of information. Back in the 60s and 70s, there was a man by the name of Donald Noos who created tech for typesetting mathematical equations beautifully using uh, software. And he was able to create a tool that is still used today uh, in a, a slightly different form called LaTeX. And there, the, um, the technology has certain special characters and keywords that allow the compiler to allow the renderer to uh, have instructions on how to display things properly. So this is definitely a declarative way of um, working with technology. 
So if I back up for a moment here, um, before all this markup language technology came about, we only had text files, which would be just writing a bunch of text onto the screen um, and then saving it as a text file. If you wanted to make that more readable, then, uh, well, you, you don't have a way to bold or italicize or underline words. And so somebody figured out a way to do that using markup tags to signify certain words. So you might have, um, I don't know, if you're making a glossary, for instance, I guess like a dictionary. So dictionary glossary, you have key value pairs, you have the key, and maybe you wanna bold or italicize that to make it easy to find in a huge block of text. And then you wanna have the definition for that word, and you can use regular text for that. So then for each item in the glossary, you would have a way to denote a bullet point to say here is a new item of the list. And then you might have special keywords to say let's italicize the keyword that we're interested in marking on the page. This sort of uh, ability to format a document makes it much more readable and definitely very helpful this web development world. Um, the idea behind markup languages is that it's designed so that humans can consume a bunch of text uh, in a more readable way. You can imagine if you were to read a ebook that's text only is a little bit harder than if it were nicely formatted with easy to notice headings, section headings, um, links, and so on. Um, I was told that uh, the HTML technologies were thriving um, or, or it went from didn't exist to existence because of some graduate students who wanted to send their dissertation to people in other cities and they wanted the formatting to be retained and so they figured out the technology to send their thesis to other people in other cities. I mentioned that you have markup tags to denote the uh, formatting for special words. So tags is one of the concepts in HTML, the other is attributes. Tags are used to say start and end um, for that particular function. So if you have H1, for instance, a heading of level one, you can then say start with heading one right before here and then end at the end of the string. Most tags have a open and close um, structure to it. Uh, we'll go over the rules for this on the next slide. The other concept for HTML is the attributes for each tag. A tag does not have to have attributes, but if you want to customize the way the tag looks, then you do have to add the attributes. The exception would be a few particular tags. Like for instance, if you have a link, you do have to define the hyperlink that it's linked to. And if you have an image, then you want to link to the image file as well. There are some basic rules regarding the use of tags and of where, where to use them. The first rule is that you must have an open and closed tag with when you're using them. The exceptions to this are just a few that I can think of off the top of my head, such as image, uh, line break, BR, and horizontal rule, HR. Pretty much all the other tags in existence are going to be in the format of the open and the close uh, tags. The second rule to remember is that when you have multiple tags, so for instance, if you want both bolded and italicized fonts, and you would open each of them, but it's also a nested structure where you have to close them in the same order. So you could think about mathematical expressions and the order of their parentheses in how you read this. Let's try creating a single HTML file. Typically, if you had just one single HTML file in a directory, you would use the file name index.html. 
Um, this is a customary um, convention to go with H index.html. Historically, web servers, when you open a folder path, it would have a default index listing of files in a folder. And so index.html takes that tradition and prepares a nicely formatted way of presenting information. Second to that is that most web servers are configured to look for an index uh, file name, and it could be of different file formats. Um, .html is very common to use. Uh, you can also use .htm, or depending on what sort of, I guess, um, you know, if you're using PHP, you can use .php. Uh, if it's Perl, you can use Perl, etc. When you're naming an HTML file, you don't want to use any special characters because sometimes the URL gets encoded and it'll turn, for instance, a white space into percent %20, or if you have special characters, you don't know if it might encode to something else. And so it just adds some complexity that might not be needed. And so if you can avoid it, that's great. I think most servers would be flexible enough to allow you to use any character. For the highest level of compatibility across different servers and operating systems and and also for easier time of sharing your links with other people you want to start with a letter as opposed to a number or special character and furthermore you also want to keep the file name pretty short inside the index.html file you would have some text that you would have some text to describe the HTML structure. The first line should be the doc type to signify the exact flavor of HTML that you're using. Um, if you forget to add this, most browsers are going to be smart enough to know how to render the page. But for appropriateness, you should include it. Enter that first line within the file you're going to have the HTML tag, open an HTML tag to denote um, the starting of this HTML page. And that'll be ended at the very end of the file. Within that block, you now have the head section and the body section. I have in the upper right corner a uh, diagram showing how it could look like a tree structure where you have uh, for each further indented block, it becomes a child of the outdented uh, section. And so the HTML tag is the root for the file, and the head and the body are children of HTML. The head subtree is where you would add metadata and information about the page that maybe you don't want the user to see within the browser window, but maybe is relevant to cataloging. That, uh, that, that page. And so for instance, search engine bots might use information there to figure out the relevance of your page to other pages. And that's also where you can have information about linking to style sheets, uh, JavaScript files. You can also have further information for the browser to know how to like uh, display a fa fav icon or uh, the title and other like metadata information. Uh, we're going to go ahead and fill in the body. Um, I have here some arbitrarily selected uh, tags to work with, just to show you a variety of different tags. Uh, I have first H1 to denote heading of level one. This is, uh, this is one of the common tags where most browsers will know to, by default, display this with a bolded and larger font. This sort of specification is like a standard across most browsers. I believe the W3C has specifications on that. Uh, a sibling node to the H1 that I have described there is the div tag to say, here's a new section. And within that section, I have a paragraph tag, and within that, a anchor link a tag with um, the URL for our 
wonderful school. Um, the anchor link tag A must have the attribute href, hyperlink reference, to link to the URL of where you want to send people to with that link. The image tag below the paragraph there is one of those special tags that have no closing tag. You don't only have the opening tag, and because it is image tag, you do want to declare the source for the file image. You can have a relative path if the image is on your server, and if it's on a separate server, then you want to have the HTTP uh, part of the URL and the whole server path to that image. Finally, we have a few other attributes like alternative text and then height and width. Um, this is one single file, which is a nice place to start with, but most websites are going to have more than one HTML file to, to have you work with. And so most of the time when you hear about people building websites, it kind of just assumes it's more than one single HTML file. You can have websites that are just a single page, and you might have heard something like single page architecture. That's more of a JavaScript thing uh, that we're not going to go into in this talk. Maybe like up to 10 years ago, most websites were uh, basically directories on a web server. So like a machine had publicly accessible folders, and websites would just be links that direct to specific folders on a machine. And a web developer would then have different HTML files to denote different pages within that website. Um, so you might have, like, say if you have a newspaper, you might have the sports section in one directory and you might have the classified in another directory. Um, and then maybe like the headlines in another directory. And from there you might have page one, page two, et cetera. You might also be, uh, you know, back then, be creating a um, online portfolio, which then you might have a page for your, your landing page, and then maybe another one describing your work, and then another one with your biography. And so all of these, you know, could be on one single page of you know, different sections on that page, but you could also split it up into multiple files. Um, but either way, the point that I want to make is that uh, at some point you're going to scale from one page into a website. And so then that becomes more of like a management problem of how do you make sure that all the pages of your website are consistent with each other in terms of the structure, because HTML is about the structure. Um, so how do you make sure all the pages have consistency? And then how do you make sure that you're able to quickly or efficiently manage all these different HTML tags across different pages. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the techniques for managing structure on the web uh, using web technology. Um, I'm going to first start with a older technology, which is called using includes. Includes is basically the function include it, that is available in most of the, I guess, earlier scripting languages where if, say, for instance, you were used PHP, you can say, I want to include a particular file right here in my PHP file. And then, um, you know, you might have, say, if it's your online portfolio and you want to have the same links across every single page, but you don't want to maintain the same set of like five links, for instance, you can have that menu be its own include page menu.php or menu.html. And then wherever you want to include that, you would just have that script function include to say include that block of HTML uh, tags, that subtree, include that subtree uh, where I want it. Um, the key to using includes is to help make a consistent theme uh, in terms of structure across all your websites, because when you have a consistent structure, then it makes it easier for your end user to find whatever it is they're looking for. Along with that, you know, like within the browser window of being able to maintain the consistency, you now then uh, with the website should think about 
considerations such as the URL routes and how that, um, the semantics of that and how that links with what you're organizing. Because when it comes to management, you wanna make it efficient and an intuitive sort of design. So now onto newer technology. We could use includes, but that's if your server has the capability with the uh, scripting language installed. There are some web hosts that do not have the scripting language feature due to security, or it could just be due to like resource management that it's not efficient for them to host it, so it's not available. You might have access to web hosts that allow you to, to save static files. That means files that do not need a change, so text files, HTML files, images, uh, videos, etc. One of the tools that came about to create a static website, um, so that would be the, the first bullet point here, the static site generator. This is a tool that allows you to convert regular text files, most likely markdown files, into a whole entire website with nicely formatted HTML uh, structure. Another way you can manage a bunch of files and consistency of HTML is to use a web framework to create a entire site uh, with possibly a content management component. What I wanted to point out is that you can use different tools out there to manage the construction and maintenance of a website. The, the difference between all these options depends on limitations of your web server, as well as limitations on your, your team, software development team, how much resources you have there, as well as like other considerations such as cost uh, in terms of money and time, as well as you know what is the scope of the problem. So without uh, making it a discussion of making a good choice, I just wanted to offer some of the options that are available, uh, some of the technologies and um, tools available to help manage the complexity of having a bunch of different HTML tags floating around for your website. Okay, so now that concludes the part on the structure. And the next part I wanna talk about is then styling. So like we've talked a little bit about like how you can get started with creating structure and um, how some of the scaling concerns become evident pretty early on. The second part of the Cake Boss workflow is styling. So now I wanna talk about the styling part for web design. After you've created a structure with HTML, then you wanna focus on all the stuff that makes the wow factor apparent. So you can, go, you can start from the structure and the lines and the text and all the elements that you wanna have, but now let's focus on like how, how do you define what you want. Again, CSS is declarative, just like HTML is declarative. CSS was created after HTML. So HTML took a few decades since the inception of web or network technology to come about. So you had the internet, I think, in the 60s and 70s, but then um, HTML needed a couple decades and became much more popular in the 90s. And there were a few years where people were just trying to figure out, like, how do I style a website and manage all the different styles. It was not fun to, you know, be defining like, I want this color, this size, et cetera, et cetera. So then somebody in the mid nineties decided we should go with CSS um, because uh, this person was inspired by LaTeX and decided, you know what, we could have the style rules separate from the HTML documents, make it easier to manage and then have a way to tell the browsers how to handle rendering different styles. Furthermore, styles can cascade, which means that the inheritance property makes it much easier to quickly build up a beautiful website instead of being locked into like specifying at the leaf level of every like tree. 
styles can cascade, which means that the inheritance properties makes it really easy to create consistency across multiple websites. CSS does follow hierarchy of specificity, meaning if you have the HTML tags in a certain path of a tree, then if you want to be specific and say you want a certain child node of a certain path, you can specify it that way as opposed to saying all the nodes in a subtree. You can also allow multiple style sheets on the same page, but if you have the same selector path, then the most recently defined one will override everything else. We're going to revisit the HTML um, block that we had worked with before, only now we're going to have the font color defined in HTML. In HTML, before CSS, you were limited to this fashion where you can say, I have an attribute for the color. You can also say attribute of like the, the font size or the font family. It wasn't fun because like if you wanted to edit all this, you would have to specify the exact attributes for each HTML tag, you know, where it's created. So now if you want to use CSS, you can use the style attribute and then put the CSS rules in the key value pair structure within that, that style attribute. So for instance, the last slide, we saw that the image was defined with separate width and height attributes, but now we can condense that into the style, uh, the inline CSS style attribute with the width and height right there. Similarly with font, we can move the color attribute into the style attribute. And so that's how it looks like. Another way to define a style is to have a style block in the head metadata section of the HTML. So what you can do here is that instead of being limited to just the tags that you're working with, you can now say any tag with um, the image selector can have these properties and also any font tag has the color red. So now if you have multiple tags of the same name, you can repeat these styles. The last option with CSS is to manage a bunch of styles is you can use a separate CSS file format um, and you give it and you give it a name style.css is shown here. Um, and then you would just put all your styles in that file. And the formatting looks very much like the style block, which has the curly braces to denote each of the rule blocks and um, properties within each of the blocks. A CSS rule block um, is a selector followed by curly braces. The indentation is not important for it to work, but it does help with readability. So oftentimes you'll see that folks will indent the insides uh, within a curly brace block. The inside are key value pairs. So you have a very much, I guess, JSON looking blob there where you can have the key on the left followed by a colon and then the value that you have uh, that you want to specify for that key. And then it ends with a semicolon to say end of that rule. If you have a single uh, rule inside a block, you can ignore the semicolon, but um, it's good practice just to keep it there. Um, it's really good to have that consistency. So right now in the time of uh, social distancing, we have this idea that people should be six feet away from each other. And so I thought this would be a really good way to talk about or a good analogy to introduce the CSS box model. You can have um, styles defined in one of four directions, the top, the bottom, the right, and the left. If you were to say that you want to have a margin of three feet, that means for any element of the people tag, you can have three feet around it. Uh, mathematically, this is correct because if you have two people, then you have three plus three on both sides, which equals to six feet. Uh, let's now go into some of the techniques for managing a bunch of styles. 
First of all, you can create your own framework or if you are not interested in that kind of work, you can borrow somebody else's framework. So there are a lot of designers out there who create frameworks to be able to like quickly get a nice looking website. So the way you would use that is to link to that style sheet. So either you get a copy or you find some CDN somewhere on the web that hosts this publicly and lets you access it. Um, so then you just link to that style sheet. And then now you have all the styles that are defined in that style sheet for use in your own website. I link some of the more commonly known uh, CSS frameworks. So you have Material Design, Bulma, Bootstrap. I, I think Zurb also has one called Foundation. Not important to say like one is way better than the other. It really depends on your needs in terms of borrowing somebody else's framework. But the thing that is common with all of these is that they are based on a grid system, which comes from the print layout uh, days where you have specific like subsections within an entire page and you want to divide that up so that you can neatly mathematically calculate that you want your stuff to be in one um, area and, and not the whole page. An example from Bootstrap where you can have different uh, column widths defined. So they've got three examples here, three different rows with different column widths. You can have the left side wider than the right and then you can have three, uh, three of the same size columns and then you have one that's like two columns equal widths. So depending on which CSS framework that you're using, the column names are going to be different. Usually a page is divided by 12 blocks horizontally across. Um, I have here an example using the Bulma system because it's slightly simpler in terms of their class name semantics. Uh, so uh, if you have an example with two columns and you want to specify the left side to be one third of the width and the right side two thirds, then you can specify, I have a section here with two columns, or sorry, a section here to start columns. And then in there you can define two different columns. And the first one you say, I want it one third, and then the CSS will be smart enough to know that the second column will take up the rest of the space. Now say for instance, you decide that you, you have used somebody else's framework, it's not good enough, you wanna create your own, only you wanna support a bunch of different uh, style widgets and you wanna support a bunch of different devices. And so there's a lot of stuff to be managed and perhaps you wanna use the same, I don't know, color palette. Um, how might you do that? You can use a CSS preprocessor um, and there's a few out there. The two most popular ones, Sass and Less, are shown here on the screen with their links. These are both very similar and I'm just gonna show you one feature that is similar across both that, you know, where I tend to use this the most. So let's say I have a color palette defined for a website and so maybe color shades are of a certain specific value but it's hard to remember that hex value so then I'll say like here is a background color here I have black but we could specify something a little bit more um, difficult to remember and so instead of remembering that hex value we can then just say like background color and then anywhere that I want that same color I can say background equals that color this is also good if you want to like have different people on a design team to work on the the look of a website because you can have one person be responsible for choosing the colors and to say well we want this blue to be like a teal kind of blue and they provide you with the hex value and then the other person um, on the team could just be ensuring that it's all defined in the right places but you know just they've got that one BG um, variable to work with. The, the two preprocessors that I've shown also have features where you can define that maybe like one color is gonna be 50% lighter than the other, or you might even have other functions like use this kind of shadow. Um, you have two different shadows, for instance, 
and then you can define where you want to use the first one and where you want to use the second one and then just reuse it. So, so the preprocessor tool is great. Um, it, it helps you be a more efficient web designer because you're able to reuse stuff and you're not trying to maintain a bunch of stuff that is like the exact same thing. You can uh, abstract your work a little bit and create a more maintainable set of style sheets. And when you're ready to test your preprocessor uh, styles, you can either in development use it in the browser and so you would just link to the JavaScript and the less or so I'm using less as the example. So if you have SAS, then you would link to the SAS file. So basically you would have a JavaScript file in the browser that does a conversion in real time, but that's not efficient if you were to send your product off to production. So in that case, you can then convert whatever preprocessor format into CSS using command line tools. So those are really like the two options to allow for a like end product um, that is more optimized. And finally, to manage styles, some design teams will come up with a style guide that will describe all the different uh, intricacies required for whatever product is being built. So they'll specify things like here's the font that we should have and here's, you know, all the borders should have a certain amount of rounding in the corners and then here's the colors, um, shadows, uh, button sizes, etc. So all of that are just the principles and the guidelines defined in one single document. I've seen cases where the style guide is just a written document, maybe a PDF file or a Word document. I've also seen style guides being created using the preprocessor tools or just a regular CSS file. And it's just like, I don't know, a, a like consistency that the whole team adheres to. So it can be produced in a number of different formats can have slightly more technical or slightly less technical, but in any case, the style guide serves as a single reference point source of truth uh, when it comes to making design decisions. So that ends the portion of this talk on HTML and CSS. I had, when creating this talk, thought about some design considerations that are prevalent when you're designing for the web but it was too much for this one single talk, so I've separated that out to another part.